Hello everyone, today I'm taking a look at this mini PC, the Paladin W04. This guy has a Ryzen 5 7640HS mobile CPU, Radeon 760 graphics, mobile of course. Uh, it's in a pretty small package, 2.5 gig Ethernet, 32 gigs of included DDR5, 2.5 gig Ethernet, 1 gig Ethernet, HDMI display port, USB 4, Thunderbolt, and uh, yeah, so if you guys want to see my testing of this, then come along on this adventure. Also, disclosure, Paladin sent me this unit for review. No money changed hands, they aren't paying me, and they won't see the review until you do. So, come along. W.O. Series Mini PC. Don't any of that. So this guy is the unit itself. Okay, magnetic quick release. So I just pop the cover off. This looks exactly like the last one I looked at. Tail to enter BIOS. Nice that they put this on the sticker. Okay, on the front panel here, we got two USB 3s, a Type-C power button, clear CMOS, and a peel. Back of the unit, 19 volt USB 4. I'm going to test that that really is USB 4. DisplayPort HDMI USB 2 and 2.5 and gig LAN. These little stickers tell you that Windows might do updates and mess you up. And one is 1 gig and one is 2.5. Bottom of the unit, I got fan and two mounting holes, probably for a vase amount. Also got a power brick. This guy is 120 watts. Okay. HDMI cable. M.2 heatsink with thermal gap pad pre-attached, bag of screws, and face and mounting bracket. So of course I am going to do a full teardown later in the video, but first I'm going to boot it up in Linux and we're going to see what the hardware looks like. So for hookup, I got here my Cytrans Kiwi, so this is a HDMI capture device. So I can capture HDMI and also emulate USB HID, so go ahead and plug that in. Next up, I've got my flash drive with Ubuntu on it. I've got two and a half gig ethernet. I'll plug that in as well, up, upside down. And I got power. So let's get this guy booted up. And I'm in the BIOS. So here we go. Let's see what I got on this flash drive. UEFI, PMAP, let's go. Oh, that was not what I wanted at all. And we're in the BIOS. So let's go ahead and boot Ubuntu. By the way, if you've seen me review a Paladin W04 before, that's because I did, and their model numbers are a little bit confusing. More about that at the end of the video, though. Just know you're not crazy. And we're in Ubuntu. So we've got a lot going on on the PCI side. So this is AMD Phoenix, as we expected. We have a Realtek 8125 2.5 gig. Uh, MediaTek MT7922. Uh, NIC and 8111 gigabit NIC. And what else we got going on here? Pink Sardine, USB 4 Thunderbolt controller, neat. Micron Technology, NVMe. NVMe running at Gen 4x4, by the way. Second NVMe, by the way, also PCIe Gen 4x4. As for the USB, it looks like we got MediaTek, probably Bluetooth, and everything else is my test setup. CPU is the 7640HS. And we've got six cores, 12 threads. Also, while I'm here with Ubuntu, one of the neat features of Thunderbolt and USB 4 in general is you can plug two computers in directly to each other and they should be able to talk to each other over Thunderbolt. This does not work with normal USB 3, um, but for Thunderbolt it does. So I got a USB 3 cable here. I'm gonna plug this into, get in there. So stiff, so Thunderbolt on that side, laptop on this side, and what do we got? We got nothing. Uh, I'm plug it, plug it back in again. Okay, I guess we'll try this cable. This is only a 10 gig cable, but it should still work. Uh, I don't even see it in D message. Okay, in case I'm crazy, let's go to the front port. My laptop is charging, so something is working. I'm trying both of my good cables here um, that I use for other test systems, and I'm getting... Oh, well, there we go. Now it works on this port. This is usually what we see when we get the wrong USB version. I guess a front port detected it. Seems like a normal USB 3 interaction where they can't set up anything mutual, but they detect each other. Back port, I'm getting power, but 
nothing else. It's it's weird. Weird. Okay, let's go back to the good cable that's from my Kiwi. So we'll put the Kiwi back on the short cable. Okay, so we found a new retimer. Um, that's the start of something. There we go. Now we got Thunderbolt Net. That's our IP address. Can we iperf it? 11 gigabits. Okay. It's not bad. It works. Okay, so backport does work for Thunderbolt. Maybe I have a bad cable. I literally only use this cable for testing mini PCs. I keep it good just for this purpose. But it could be cable. Uh, it could also be something flaky. I don't know. So, seems to work fine for my testing. Got 11 gigabits out of it. This is a 40 gigabit cable, but you're limited by, of course, the speed of many things, not just the cable. So, that's what I got for Thunderbolt. And now, the part you've all been waiting for, the teardown. So first off, I've got this little notch here, and I can just peel off this cover. It's held on by these four magnets. There's four corresponding magnets that are tucked up under here. And this cover also has room for a two and a half inch drive bay, even though there's nowhere to put it, really. Also, by the way, since I did review a previous generation of the W04, over time, I noticed these magnets came out on my old unit. Now, it took quite a while for that to happen. I did use, I mean, I do use most of these mini PCs to test in different videos. So I was using it to test and I was opening and closing it. And the magnets eventually started coming out. I think they're glued or something. Not sure, not sure if they've improved since then, just something I noticed about the older unit. So inside this handy magnetic cover, there are two slots here for M.2s. This M.2 is the one that came with it. It was originally in this slot. I moved it over to test the bandwidth of both slots. Underneath there, we've got the MediaTek Wi-Fi card. So that's PCI Express and USB, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Over here, we've got two different RAM slots. So we're doing dual channel. We got 16 gigs per stick. Looks like we've got SK Hynix RAM chips on this guy. So these are DDR5 5600, 16 gig sticks each. And we got two sticks and dual channel, nice. That's pretty much we, all we can get to from this side, but that's really all we need to get to since these are the only things we would replace. You obviously have to add your own second SSD. I don't think there's a SATA connector on this one. So on the last unit, there was spot to use this um, two and a half inch cover with a SATA cable. This one doesn't have that, but it has a second M.2 instead, which I think is nicer anyway, because I won't, I don't want to use two and a half inch drives now. But uh, yeah, so let's flip it over and take the back off. So here we've got spot for the bracket. So it includes this bracket to attach to a vase amount like that or like that or whatever. But I got four screw holes down in here. So let's find a screwdriver for that. Okay, back just pops right off. And all we've got on this side is the cooler. It is quite large. So looks like we've got copper heat pipes going here to like a laptop style blower. Um, that's a heck of a big blower for a CPU of this. So I'm guessing we're not going to thermal throttle, but I'll probably have to test that later. And there's also a BIOS battery stuck in there, and that's all you have access to on this side. It's all heatsink. Um, not that you really need access to anything else because all the connectors are on the front and the back, but everything you need. So I'll put this back together and we'll test some thermals. So to test thermals, I'm gonna run a stress test on the CPU on Linux. I'm booting Ubuntu again. I've also got a kilowatt meter here measuring power at the wall with the included charge brick. Currently it's running, it's pulling 5.2 watts from the wall, 5.3, 5.8, something like that. So let's see what we hit with an all core stress test and see where the temperatures go. So there we go. I got two different temperature sensors graphed. Key control comes off the CPU and edge comes off the GPU. So it's like our usage is spiked up. We hit 87C, which is kind of as expected. Power at the wall is hovering around 75 watts, roughly. And there's quite a bit of heat coming out here. So the fan stuck in from the two sides. A little straight out the back here, underneath all these connectors. It's, it's warm. I mean, it's not hot, but it's blowing a lot of air. I can hear it. It's not that loud, but it's working. So we've hit 91 Celsius on T-Control. I'd also like to point out that an all-core stress test is not at all representative of what a real CPU does. Even if you're doing virtualization, home lab kind of stuff, you're not going to be pegging your home lab CPU day in, day out. Unless you're trying to do AI, but then you wouldn't be doing a CPU, you'd be doing a GPU, and you probably wouldn't be using this box. So 
Let's see where our long-term power ends up at. Our temperatures have fallen very suddenly down to 83 and our power level has fallen down to 62 watts. That must be like our long-term power target. So each of these blocks is four minutes, so it looks like we were at power for two minutes. Then we've dropped down to a lower power level where we're staying at about 82 Celsius, 81 Celsius. It's pretty happy. Okay, that's enough of you. Go ahead and cool down now. And we're back to six watts. So, since I love you guys, I'm going to put up with the Windows 11 setup wizard so we can run 3 Mark and see what the GPU performance is like here. I mean, I hate booting into Windows on a PC like this. I would never really use this for Windows, but some of you might. It came with Windows, so take a look. Oh no, that's what they warned me not to do. You guys remember when Linux made it this hard to boot a live system just to test shit? No checking for updates, no like three security questions, all that stuff. Pepperidge Farmer members. Remember when we had to install drivers manually? What is this? Stone Age? Okay, so for a like gaming benchmark, you guys get 3D Mark Time Spy. Not Time Spy Extreme, just the regular Time Spy. And with its benchmark, we got a score of 2811. Now that's pretty darn good. That's almost twice as high as a Steam Deck for some comparison. So it's pretty on par with other mobile CPUs of its generation and class. There are higher end mobile graphics out today. This is of course a mobile CPU. Obviously this is not nearly as good as a discrete graphics card, but if you just need some basic graphics performance, mobile GPUs are really not bad these days. So what do I think about the W04 here? Well, to ground this discussion, this model I have in my hand right now, 32 gigs of DDR5 and a one terabyte Gen 4 NVMe SSD is $450, give or take some change. If you go down to the lower model, which is the same hardware, but with 16 gigs of DDR5 instead of 32, and a 512 gig drive instead of one terabyte, it is 380, so $70 cheaper. So following that logic, if we included no storage, no RAM, it should be about 300. And I think that's a fair price for what you get here. So it's a newer generation CPU than the old W04, also, by the way, I reviewed a W04 before, and it was pretty much the same case as this. I think I mentioned earlier that the magnets eventually came off, but it took a while for that to happen. Um, one other downside I found with this long term is that because the lid is held on with magnets, when you're changing the M.2s out, you can get the screw to jump over to the magnet and get stuck under the magnet. Um, so then it doesn't rattle around, it's just stuck to the magnet, which I found kind of frustrating. Um, of course, I'm changing M.2s a lot more than you probably are. You're probably just putting your M.2 and being done with it, but I change these things out to test them all day, so that's what I found. Also, um, this is the newer CPU, so this is the Ryzen 5 7640, the last one had the 5600, so it's a newer generation Ryzen processor. They've got Thunderbolt with that, which is really cool, I like seeing Thunderbolt. Great for mini PC networking, if you get two of these, you can do a high-speed Thunderbolt, backbone between them. They don't even have to be this one, just two different things with Thunderbolt. Um, if used as a mini server, for example, you could plug this in with your laptop with Thunderbolt and get high-speed storage for editing or something like that without having to buy a 10 gig NIC for your laptop, which is also cool. Um, I'm not going to use it for that, but I'm sure plenty of people do. Build quality. Build quality seems adequate. Pretty much everything is plastic except the heatsink, obviously. The cooler is quite beefy. You guys saw it earlier in the video. The magnetic lid is very nice for access, although the magnets can be frustrating at times. Um, it's very, very easy to work on. There's only two things to change inside, really, the RAM and the SSDs. We've got two SSD slots. Both are blazing fast Gen 4x4. Nice to see that. Some of these mini PCs give you, like, the second slot at lower bandwidth or lower lane count. Not these guys. Good on them. Also good on using dual-channel RAM. Far too many of these in systems, especially the Intel ones. Only have single-channel RAM. Probably Intel's fault, but whatever. 32 gigs. Plenty of RAM for a mini PC here. This would be an excellent little server. It's got dual NICs. They are different NICs, unfortunately. So one's two and a half gig, one's one gig. Um, most people that use two NICs would probably like them to be the same. Um, most people that use two and a half gig also probably don't need two NICs or they need more than two NICs. I don't know. You've got options, I guess. They are all Realtek NICs for the wired. That makes a lot of sense to me because the Intel two and a half gig NICs, even though the people that use PFSense say they're the best NIC ever, they had a lot of problems. 
So if you're using an operating system based on Linux or Windows, you really probably want the Realtek NIC, or you really want the Aquantia NIC, Marvell. That's my favorite two and a half gig NIC, but it's not in a lot of mini PCs. Most of them use either the Intel i226, i225, or the Realtek. So this one's Realtek. Um, the Wi-Fi is MediaTek. I didn't look up the exact specs on that. I believe it does not do six gigahertz. It's a uh, dual MIMO, basic stuff, but perfectly adequate. Actually, in Wi-Fi land, also, using MediaTek is better than Intel because Intel can't do Wi-Fi hotspotting. So for whatever reasons, Intel's drivers will refuse to do hotspotting on 5 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz on devices that support 6. So you can't use this as an access point if it has an Intel Wi-Fi. But this is not Intel Wi-Fi, this is MediaTek, and MediaTek lets you do whatever you want. So good on that. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about this guy. I'm going to put him back in the box and put him back on my shelf where all of the other mini PCs I have live. Um, I have just recently started selling these guys on eBay because I moved to Finland. Um, I am in the U.S. temporarily for just a few more weeks. I would never actually intended on selling all these guys. Um, they're actually pretty useful for testing other things in the lab, just kind of accumulating them. And I would kind of feel bad selling them because they got sent to me for review. But I don't have the space. I have to get rid of them, so I'm selling them. Um, this guy might or might not get listed, I'm not sure yet, but if he does, drop by, drop where you came from on the, on the eBay and I'll give you half price or less, so, yeah. Also, check out my Discord server, that's where I message things like this frequently. They've been very helpful to me, not on this guy specifically, but on a lot of my other projects. We chat about wild things there all the time. If you want to give me a tip, I have a Kofi link down below for that as well. And, uh, I have a Mastodon if you want to follow me there, and I'll see you guys on the next adventure.